Right. Thanks, Victoria. Uh, my name's Kevin Masaryk. I'm a groundwater education specialist with University of Wisconsin Extension and the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. Uh, my role as a state specialist is to help um, people with, with rural private wells learn more about their, their water source, which in general is gonna be groundwater. And I was contacted a, a few years ago uh, when Green County was looking at, at trying to develop a program to answer this question of, of how is groundwater quality in Green County changing over time? And, and you all uh, most likely, if you're listening, may be part of the program which we're using as kind of a way to understand that question where we've recruited a number of landowners that we're hoping uh, will participate uh, in this program by testing their well water every year for the, the, the next, uh, actually over the course of five years. So we are in year two of, of what is hopefully gonna be a five year program to, to answer this question or understand this question in a little bit more detail. So in the time we have together tonight, what I'd like to do is just provide a, a brief basic of groundwater in, in Greene County. Uh, talk a little bit about the, the project goals and the process in case people are unfamiliar with how uh, that process or the, the wells that were included came to be. We'll talk about the individual tests that we perform every year and what they mean, uh, as well as what we've learned so far about groundwater quality in Green County. And it's still relatively early, uh, year two of five, we're still just beginning to kind of scratch the surface of the questions that we hope to answer. Um, we'll cover looking forward, what comes next in terms of uh, the project. And then as Victoria mentioned, we'll wrap up with some Q and A. Uh, just to get everybody on the same page about where their well water comes from, uh, our well water, you know, is basically groundwater and, and groundwater is not an underground lake. It's not an underground river. It's just rainwater or snow melt, some of which, which infiltrates into the ground through the soil, eventually reaches a point where all the empty spaces in the soil, where all the cracks in the rock are filled with water. And that's our groundwater. Um, we use wells to access that water source. If water is not intercepted by a well, it's always going to be moving towards a nearby discharge feature. So a discharge feature might be a nearby lake, river, stream, or wetland. Because our, our groundwater, because our drinking water from our wells uh, originates as, as rain or snow melt, Obviously, anywhere or, or anything done on the land where that water is, is infiltrating has the potential to impact that water quality. So too does the rock or the soils that that water is moved or transported through uh, will impact uh, water quality of, of the water in somebody's well. Um, so that's, you know, the, the, the water, uh, water basics is that you know, water is often referred to as the universal solvent because anything water comes in contact with, it, it naturally will, will have the ability to dissolve some of that, that material. Um, so whether it's the rocks or the minerals that that water moves through, whether it's the land use where that water um, infiltrates down into the ground, even, even the types of plumbing or packaging that water is stored or transported in will impart different impurities. And in certain impurities, uh, if they're a concern for health, uh, may be referred to as, as contaminants. Um, and, and things that are tested for within this program, things like nitrate, are an example of something that we consider to be a health-related contaminant. And, and if we know the levels that uh, might be of concern, we can use that as a guide to help people understand whether their, their water, their well water is safe to drink. Um, if water is determined to be contaminated, just know that there's treatment methods out there that can generally make water safe to drink. There might be other options available looking at things like well, uh, well construction or, or drilling a new well um, that might also be alternatives in certain situations. Um, when we talk about uh, other things in water, things that might come from rocks or minerals, 
it's important to understand the different aquifers that the water is stored or transported in. And Wisconsin has this layered cake geology, uh, which is different depending on where you're at in the state. Um, generally speaking though, it's the, the geology uh, or the soils that water is stored or transported in that will impact things like how quickly water moves or might impact the quality of things like, like water hardness or alkalinity. So we know that certain rocks um, will contain different elements that will make it more likely that water, let's say, is gonna be considered to be hard water versus soft water. Um, and, and the aquifers are really important for understanding uh, some of the different water quality aspects that we might find within somebody's well. So more specifically on the, the geology of Green County, uh, again, some things that we're concerned about are the types of rock that we encounter uh, when maybe a well is drilled. And the, the map on the right is showing areas in orange contain what we call carbonate rock. And, and carbonate rock tends to have a lot of calcium and magnesium dissolved in it. Uh, it also tends to be a type of rock that tends to be, be more highly cracked or fractured meaning that water is gonna be able to move through that material much more quickly without being filtered as, as adequately. So it, in, in areas uh, where we find carbonate rock, sometimes it, it might mean that groundwater is a little bit more vulnerable or susceptible to, to activities from the land surface. Um, areas where we find sandstone, so sandstone is located in some parts of the county, uh, the areas where you see that yellowish or that orange, would represent areas where the uppermost bedrock layer is going to be sandstone. Uh, and just as the name indicates, uh, sandstone is just sand grains that have been cemented together. And there's void spaces in between the, the sand particles that allow water to move through it. Um, water moving through sandstone is going to have a greater ability to be kind of filtered out. Um, water moving through sandstone generally is going to move a little bit more slowly, a little bit more uniformly, um, and maybe a little bit more resistant or, or less prone to contamination. Also, sandstone doesn't contain as much calcium and magnesium. So wells drilled into, let's say, sandstone rock uh, might not have as much hardness as, as wells drilled into, let's say, the carbonate rock. Another important thing to consider is the depth to bedrock. And another way to think about this is just how much soil are you going to encounter before you hit that, that uppermost bedrock layer. And what we see that in, in many parts of Greene County, uh, the depth to bedrock or the depth of those soil deposits is relatively thin. So those areas which are, are orange, um, in general, it's, it's indicating those areas where that soil layer is relatively thin before you encounter some sort of uh, carbonate or sandstone bedrock. Uh, areas in the, the, the river valleys tend to have deeper, thicker, kind of unconsolidated deposits, which oftentimes consist of sands or gravels that might be or might have been left behind by, by the glaciers. And sand and gravel aquifers tend to be really prolific aquifers. It's really easy to pull water out of those, uh, those areas uh, because of the types of materials that, uh, that, that you find there. Um, but the, the depth of the soil, I always uh, tend to say the soil is like the skin on our bodies. It's kind of the first barrier, the first line of defense for protecting our groundwater. So areas where the soil layers tend to be thicker, maybe offer a little bit more filtering ability for things like bacteria uh, from the land surface than areas where you might find kind of shallow soil before you encounter bedrock. Um, the other thing to describe is just the, the soil permeability. Um, so how quickly does water move through the soil, through those uppermost layers of, of material um, as it's infiltrating into the ground? And again, areas near the river valleys, those uh, soil characteristics tend to be more permeable, which mean that water is going to be able to move into or recharge those areas a little bit faster uh, than in other parts of Greene County. So uh, soil permeability, the, the types of rocks that we find, um, the depth of the soil are all things that go into understanding maybe uh, the ease with which contaminants from the surface can, can get into groundwater and reach somebody's well. 
Um, the other thing that we have to consider is the land use. Uh, so aquifers and the geology can uh, determine groundwater flow rates, but also some of the different uh, quality characteristics. And then land use is the other, the other big thing that we consider. Um, and I'm going to go through each of the individual tests to help us understand what is the dominating factor for, for controlling the various tests. And we'll refer back to this land use map, but showing in terms of the, the land cover, um, the areas in kind of yellow or orangish, which is uh, probably the most uh, dominant land use or land cover in Greene County, indicate areas where there's maybe some corn, corn being grown. The dark green would be areas where there's fields where there's soybeans being grown. And this particular layer I think is from 2020. So it's, it's one of the more recent years from year to year that can obviously change. Uh, but in general areas where you see corn is probably an area where in other years you might be seeing corn or maybe soybean. Um, there's other areas outlined in kind of the, the pink, uh, which would indicate kind of alfalfa fields. Uh, the light green or the dark green or the, the kind of different, different shades, lighter shades of green might indicate areas where we have hay uh, or forested, forested landscapes. Um, so this map is also going to be used to help explain maybe some of the patterns that we see with regards to consist constituents that were analyzed in this program. Um, why were you selected? Uh, just going over some of the, the recruitment strategy that we had in, in year one uh, of the project, which uh, was we wanted to select or recruit people that had wells with a known well construction record. And, and that's important when we start analyzing things like the relationship of well depth or casing depth to water quality. We want to be able to know how deep is a well drilled, how deep does that casing extend into the aquifer. Uh, we want to know a little bit about the geology where that well was constructed. That's all going to be really useful for us as we start analyzing the data. Uh, so we focused on those wells drilled after 1988 because they would have a Wisconsin unique well number and make locating that information relatively easy. Um, once that criteria was met, if, if there was more than one well uh, in an area, we, we tried to find at least one well per section across Greene County uh, that, that we could locate uh, that unique well number for. Um, and, and why was it one well per section? Well, we wanted to make sure that the wells were spatially distributed across the county. Uh, and that's gonna allow us to account for the wide variety of soils, geology and land use that we talked about in those previous slides. And then all things being equal, we, we did give preference to those landowners that participated in previous extension well testing efforts because it gives us an ability to look even further back in time to see how, how water quality today might compare to five or 10 years ago uh, when those individuals may have, may have tested. Um, in total, uh, last year we reached out to just under 800 landowners. And in year one of the project, uh, we tested 348 wells. And in year two of the project, uh, we are at 314 wells. So we do expect some attrition as people move um, from year to year. Uh, and, and our goal is that by the end of year five, we have at least 240 landowners that have sampled in, in each of the five years that the program has been conducted. So we really hope that, that all of you uh, that participated in years one and two, it's, it's really critical and, and, and we're really hoping uh, that you will continue to participate in these programs to allow us to achieve our goal of 200, at least 240 samples uh, over the course of the five years. If we, if we got more than that, we'd be ecstatic, uh, but the bare minimum we're shooting for is 240 samples um, testing in each of the, the years. Um, our goal for this project is really to, to learn how groundwater quality changes over time. And I think the, the best analogy is to look at this like the, the Dow Jones Index of groundwater quality in Greene County. Uh, we want to be able to know from year to year how is, is water quality changing and to, to understand trends, really that 
uh, requires us to test the same wells each year and on a routine basis for an extended period of time. Um, if we were to collect random samples to try and address this question, it would be much more difficult to try and make sense of the data. Uh, so that's where all of you come into play is that uh, we really want uh, to test the same wells year in, year out, so that we can kind of assess um, not only countywide what that average looks like, but within individual wells, uh, what does that pattern from year to year look like? Um, again, each part of the county is unique, uh, and we may see in some areas that some wells are getting better. We may see in other areas some wells are getting worse. Uh, the vast majority of wells probably are going to stay relatively similar, the same throughout the project. But um, that's really the goal is to understand where those changes are taking place uh, and then what we can learn from those, those changes. Um, the year two overview, you re may remember uh, getting a sample kit in the mail in November. In the month of December, uh, you were collecting samples and mailing them back. The samples would have been analyzed in January and you would have recently received your results in the mail, um, uh, kind of giving you an indication of what the most current water quality from the sample you submitted this year would be. And what tests were performed? Um, we focused on nitrate, chloride, conductivity, hardness, alkalinity, and pH. And you can see from this diagram, um, things like nitrate and chloride uh, are useful for understanding land use impacts on water. Uh, things like hardness, alkalinity, and pH are influenced by the soils or the rock. Uh, maybe sometimes even the weather uh, might play a role in, in, in some of these parameters as well. And then conductivity is, is something that is kind of an overall water quality kind of generic indicator test that really looks at the combination of, of both land use rocks and soils. And we'll talk about the importance of each of these tests in a little bit more detail uh, as we, we move through the presentation. Um, the first test, uh, if you're looking at interpreting that total hardness test, again, this is something that occurs naturally from the rocks or the soils that that water moves through. It's primarily calcium and magnesium and, and total hardness is basically measuring how much calcium and magnesium is in your water. Uh, naturally occurring uh, calcium and magnesium are generally beneficial to health. So these are not water quality concerns in terms of drinking water. But when we find too much calcium and magnesium in water, it, it, it does lead sometimes to problems that are more aesthetic, things like uh, scaling of pipes, uh, maybe scale development on the outside of faucets, uh, soap scum, people with hard water tend to use more detergent. And over time, hard water buildup on, let's say, a, a hot water heating coil uh, might, might cause that hot water heater to have to work much harder to heat water to the desired temperature. So most people are, are probably familiar with the term hard water uh, with regards to the way we express the units of, of hardness. Anything greater than 200 milligrams per liter of hardness would be considered to be hard water. Uh, anything between about 150 and 200 is generally ideal. And then things that are less than 150 would be considered to be soft water. Uh, where hard water tends to promote scaling, soft water is the opposite, meaning that it tends to be a little bit more aggressive or maybe corrosive water, where it might kind of interact with the plumbing system in a, in a negative way uh, from a, a corrosivity standpoint. If we look at uh, what people generally do if they have too much hardness, so too much hardness uh, levels, again, over about 200 milligrams per liter, many people will choose to, to soften their water. Uh, and, and softening water is a relatively straightforward process in that it, it removes calcium and magnesium and exchanges it for sodium or in, in some cases, potassium. Um, some of that chloride, uh, some of that, that sodium chloride salt, um, some of that chloride is going to be discharged to uh, septic systems or discharged to a drain field uh, where that chloride can sometimes uh, be a, a tracer end up giving us an indication of, 
of, of things like land use relationships to, to groundwater uh, from, from some of that chloride that might come from the softening process. If we look at um, other tests, things like alkalinity and pH, uh, these are also related to the, the soils or the geology that we encounter. Uh, alkalinity is, is generally uh, equal, uh, oftentimes it's about equal to the, the total hardness value. And alkalinity is just the ability to neutralize acid. Um, again, greater than 200, uh, water may be more likely to form scale. Alkalinity less than 150, water might be a little bit more corrosive. Because alkalinity and, and hardness basically come from the same mineralogy, uh, again, they tend to be e about equal in, in nature. Uh, and then there's pH, which many people are familiar with. Uh, that is a measure of water acidity and will help us determine you know, how corrosive water might be. We know that things that are greater than seven tend to be basic. Things that are less than seven tend to be acidic. And, and things that are acidic would be more likely to corrode plumbing. Um, if we look at the results from year two, uh, if we look at maps of the data, what you're seeing is dots showing the locations of, of individual wells. And, and we're never, you know, we, we, we never display uh, the data at a level which would allow you to see kind of the location uh, of the, the exact location of an individual participant. Uh, but these maps do allow us to view the data at kind of a generic level to maybe understand some of the patterns that might emerge from the various constituents that we're analyzing for. And the reason I show alkalinity, hardness, and pH on the same slide is that you might notice some patterns between uh, these three constituents. Uh, so for instance, alkalinity in the upper left, uh, the, the brownish and orangish colored dots would represent lower alkalinity. And the, as we get into the grays and the, the, the dark blues, those are representing higher alkalinity. Uh, the same is true for, for total hardness. Uh, the, the browns or the tans uh, are low values of hardness. As we get more into the blues, those are higher levels of hardness. Um, in some cases, you might see gray dots. Uh, those gray dots would represent softened samples. Uh, so we're not displaying the, the hardness because it's, it's artificially lowered um, due to that softening process. Um, and then uh, the, the I, unfortunately, I think I screwed up and uh, showed another map of, of total hardness instead of pH. Uh, but looking at the alkalinity and the hardness, you might kind of notice that the low levels of alkalinity and the low levels of hardness generally occur in kind of that, that eastern, uh, there's an eastern portion of, of Green County where there's kind of areas of lower alkalinity and lower hardness. In general, though, the water in Green County tends to be, you know, hard uh, water. It tends to have high alkalinity, uh, generally high pH, which is going to promote more scale formation uh, than is going to tend to than, than would corrode plumbing. There are some areas, again, in the, the river valleys near kind of Broadhead and, and Albany, where you might get some wells, uh, kind of sand and gravel wells in, the, in those river valleys, which may have lower levels of, of things like alkalinity and hardness uh, and result in slightly different water quality issues or, uh, or challenges. Um, this is just kind of illustrating that, uh, that point that when we look at the total hardness, we look at the alkalinity and the pH and the areas where we find some of those lower values. Uh, again, they're in those, those river valleys where we might have deeper surficial deposits. And, and if the well is installed into the, the bedrock, the bedrock that it's likely encountering is gonna be sandstone in nature versus let's say the, the carbonate rock, which again, tends to be a, a source of, of calcium and magnesium. Um, so the patterns that we see with regards to hardness, alkalinity, and pH generally make sense in relationship to the geology and the soils uh, where those wells are, are located. When we transition into the chloride test, uh, chloride is something that we would expect to be impacted by, by land use. 
uh, chloride levels, uh, natural levels of chloride in Wisconsin's groundwater, we would assume to be generally less than 10. Uh, greater than 10, we're starting to see maybe some indication of, of human impacts. And then greater than 250, uh, if, if levels ever got that high, people might start to notice kind of a salty taste to the water. There's no direct health effects when it comes to, to chloride levels that we generally find in, in Wisconsin's groundwater. But again, really high levels might, might lead to some aesthetic issues or problems with regards to, to the taste of the water. Um, and when we consider the sources of chloride uh, to groundwater, those sources would include fertilizers. Uh, so potash is, is common to supply potassium to crops but oftentimes uh, potash uh, might be potassium chloride. Uh, so that companion ion, that companion chloride ion uh, isn't something that is, is taken up by plants uh, and tends to, to leach into groundwater quite easily. Um, other sources of chloride may include septic systems. So human waste does contain chloride, but, it, but again, in areas where we have a lot of softening happening, uh, some of that softener salt uh, discharge to the yard or maybe the drain field uh, would, would elevate or indicate kind of elevated chloride levels in the groundwater or can contribute to elevated chloride levels in the groundwater as well. Uh, and then lastly uh, would be road salting activities. So de-icing uh, of roads or driveways or sidewalks in the winter months. Um, some of that salt is going to uh, find its way into uh, the soil or the ditches where uh, when that water uh, infiltrates into the ground, it's going to carry some of that salt with it. Um, and in a lot of cases, uh, you know, areas near major roadways or maybe major uh, development areas or parking lots uh, may see an, uh, an elevated level of, of chloride in the groundwater as a result of those land use activities. If we look at the, the Green County chloride results, uh, what you see here are maps from year one and year two. Uh, the lighter kind of orange colored uh, approaching kind of that white color would be low levels of chloride, kind of the background or natural levels. Uh, and as we get increasingly uh, kind of uh, darker uh, color gradient, uh, those would indicate higher levels. Um, and it is an unusual, again, outside kind of the, the more developed regions or along major highways to maybe see some elevated levels that might be a result of those de-icing activities. Uh, and then we'll look at some of the other land use maps that might help explain some of the patterns uh, the, that are emerging from these maps as well. I think the other thing to point out, uh, you might be looking at differences between year one and year two. And, and the patterns are generally very similar. Uh, we didn't see huge changes in chloride uh, between the two years, and that's reflected in the, the, the averages that you're seeing there. So in year one, 19.1 milligrams per liter was the average versus year two, we're seeing about 18.8 with uh, slightly less samples in year two uh, than we saw in year one. Um, the minimum uh, and the maximums were also relatively similar with respect to chloride. If we transition into nitrate, uh, nitrate is also another test that we're uh, interested in because of its ability to understand uh, particularly how land use might be impacting uh, well water and groundwater quality. Uh, if you're looking at your, your concentration, we generally uh, assume that concentrations less than one milligram per liter would be considered to be natural or background levels. Uh, concentrations above one starting to, to indicate some human impact. And then when concentrations exceed 10 milligrams per liter or are above 10 milligrams per liter, uh, that's where we consider that water to be unsafe as a drinking water source, particularly for infants and women who are or may become pregnant. And we would encourage everyone to avoid long-term consumption of water above 10 um, uh, if, that, if, if that applied to somebody's well. But certainly infants and women who are pregnant, uh, we never want them to drink water greater than 10 milligrams per liter. And then everyone else, we, we encourage to avoid long-term consumption 
uh, if levels exceed that 10 milligram per liter standard. Um, health effects, this is the one uh, analyte that we are looking at or testing for that does have some health considerations. Um, again, for infants, the, the, the concern is going to be met hemoglobinemia or, or what is commonly referred to as blue baby disease. Uh, women who are or may become pregnant, uh, possible links to birth defects or miscarriages. And then everyone else, uh, the concerns are related to, to thyroid function or the increase in the risk of, of certain types of, of cancers. The sources of nitrate, uh, very similar to chloride, some of the same sources. Uh, agricultural landscapes where we apply fertilizers. Here it's mainly nitrogen fertilizer that's going to be responsible but also animal waste or other biosolids that might be spread to fields uh, would also be a source of, of nitrate as that, uh, that organic nitrogen source breaks down and uh, eventually is converted into nitrate. Septic systems, uh, we as humans, uh, similar to animals, would excrete uh, a certain amount of nitrogen in, in, in urine or, or, or human waste that is sent to a septic system drain field. And, and septic systems uh, are designed really to remove or treat for bacteria and pathogens. They have very little ability uh, to remove things like nitrate. Um, so even properly functioning septic systems would release uh, nitrate to, uh, to groundwater. And then lastly, lawn fertilizers in areas where, where people might be fertilizing their lawns could also represent a source, but in general, the, the, that's a pretty minor uh, minor source in the in the grand scheme of Wisconsin's groundwater. Um, if we look at nitrate uh, year one, year two, or, or what you're seeing in the maps, where the the dark blue would be kind of the natural or background levels of nitrate, uh, light blue is is slightly elevated, and then as we get into the yellows and the oranges and the reds, those are increasing concentrations of nitrate. Um, a fair number of wells do show some impact. Fortunately, uh, the majority of wells are below uh, the, the 10 milligram per liter standard, but there are some wells. Uh, there were about 16% of wells in year one, about 18% of wells in year two that were greater than that, that 10 milligram per liter standard. Um, if we look at the average concentration between the year one and year two, uh, you can see uh, Maybe it looks like a slight increase. It would be tough to say uh, if that's statistically significant. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily indicate that it's a, a trend at this point. Uh, from, you, from, from one year to the next, there can be changes. Uh, so that's really why testing for more than, more than just two years is really going to be important is to understand, is that just you know, one year where it went up and we might see that next year things go down? Uh, in that we know that things with respect to, let's say, nitrate or chloride might fluctuate, uh, but from year to year, that might mean, you know, going up and, and down from year to year, rather than continuing to increase in, a, in the same direction. Um, so th that's really uh, what we're hoping to do in the future. Um, between year one and year two, we're able to start comparing these, but again, uh, it's really tough to, to be able to say with only two years of data that uh, this information constitutes any sort of, of trend at this point. Um, what I'm seeing between year one and year two is that the vast majority of wells are relatively similar. Um, and as we move forward, we'll have a greater ability to understand what that means in terms of actual trends over time. Um, if we look at relating both nitrate and chloride to land use, again, what we said is that, you know, these are things that we would expect land use to contribute to. And if we look at the, the land cover type, it's not surprising that, especially with respect to, let's say, the nitrate map, that there's a, a strong correlation with those areas where we might have more or, or kind of higher density of, of agricultural activity with, let's say, elevated nitrate levels. Um, the nitrate and the chloride patterns, to me, are, are generally kind of uh, correlated to one another. 
Um, so I suspect that in most cases, you know, the, the, the elevated chloride and the elevated nitrate would, would tend to suggest a similar source uh, of those two constituents. But again, moving forward, uh, we'll, we'll have a greater ability to kind of analyze what, what role the geology or the well depth in the surrounding land use are playing in terms of being able to predict water quality and maybe wells that, that didn't participate in this program. Uh, if you do have elevated nitrate, I'm sure people have the question of what do you do about it? Ideally, uh, we would work to try and reduce nitrogen inputs. And I think those are some of the questions that we're hoping to, to get out of this, uh, this monitoring program, which is, are there areas where uh, we'd wanna try to reduce nitrogen inputs or, or try to work to address nitrate contamination? Um, and then it's understanding where those areas are in the county and then being able to monitor progress over time. Um, that's, I think, one of the ultimate goals. However, we know that sometimes changes in water quality might take years or even longer to notice measurable improvement from, from changes at the land cover landscape scale. Uh, and therefore, you know, unfortunately, sometimes people need short-term solutions to addressing kind of the immediate needs of accessing safe drinking water. Um, in the short term, ways to reduce uh, nitrate levels or maybe access safe water uh, could be looking at uh, the well construction and, and drilling a new well. Um, I oftentimes say that that can be a, a very expensive experiment because you never really know if that's going to get you better water quality. Um, another short term solution might be uh, purchasing bottled water um, and then water treatment can sometimes be a, another cost-effective solution uh, for getting people, you know, lower nitrate drinking water. Um, when it comes to treating for nitrate, just know that nitrate can be kind of challenging to remove. So if, if you're looking to treat for nitrate, it's really important that you get a device that, uh, that is capable of, of reducing or removing nitrate from a water source. And those specific types of treatment that would be effective for nitrate would include reverse osmosis, distillation, or what's termed anion exchange. Um, sometimes I'll have people ask me, does a water softener remove nitrate? And, and the, the answer would be no. A, a traditional water softener is looking to remove calcium and mag magnesium. It has no ability to really remove nitrate. Um, another common question is, does a Brita pitcher or maybe the, the, the filter or the cartridge installed on, let's say, a refrigerator system, does that remove nitrate? And again, unfortunately, the answer uh, for those specific devices is oftentimes no. Um, so if you're looking to treat for nitrate, uh, the three devices you see here are those, that, the, are those devices that we know um, are capable of reducing nitrate in, in drinking water. Um, lastly, uh, the last test that we performed was conductivity. Uh, this is kind of an overall water quality test. It's really combining all of the other testing that we did. So it's, um, it's looking at the combination of nitrate, chloride, alkalinity, and hardness uh, and providing a measure of the total dissolved ions in that water sample. Um, it's not capable of telling us which ions are present, uh, but again, it's, it's kind of the culmination or the addition of all the different tests that we, we did. Um, generally speaking, conductivity is about twice the hardness value in an unsoftened sample. Uh, if it's much greater than twice the hardness, it provides some indica indication that maybe there's land use impacts that are contributing to elevated nitrate or elevated chloride levels. So the question may be, why would we, you know, why would we, we test for conductivity? Um, well, conductivity is, is relatively easy to measure and, and something that we could even measure uh, with, with sensors uh, that are relatively cost effective. Um, so by measuring conductivity and, and kind of relating it to some of the other parameters, uh, moving forward, we might be able to develop easier ways uh, 
uh, or continual sensors that a homeowner might be able to install on their, their household faucet or maybe a treatment unit that would allow them to, to basically get at kind of the continuous, continuous water quality measurement. So right now we're only measuring once per year, but in the future we could envision kind of these sensors which would be giving you an indication of, of water quality at, at any point in time. Um, so that's why we're, we're looking at some of these other parameters. You might say, I'm not particularly concerned about alkalinity or hardness because they're not health related contaminants. But some of these things we're interested in because it, it allows us maybe to um, develop futuring monitoring that might be, uh, that might be informative and, and allow for more continual monitoring to take place in more cost effective ways. Um, if we look at conductivity maps, again, I, I mentioned that they're uh, related to all the things that we looked at, but it's, it's probably really dominated by the alkalinity and the hardness values. So if you look at areas where we see lower uh, conductivity, those generally correspond to those areas where we saw the lower alkalinity and lower hardness values. Um, but that being said, moving forward, um, this will be useful for kind of understanding uh, water quality changes from, from year to year. Uh, what's next for the project? Uh, again, this is year two of five. Uh, here in year three, uh, we do plan a similar timeline to what took place this year, which is that we hope to mail kits to participants uh, sometime in late October, early November so that you can get those sampled and, and mailed back to us before, uh, before the holiday season. Um, in year three, uh, you'll see that each year uh, as we collect more data, we're able to build in kind of more functionality um, or build in more analysis that allows us to tell the story of Green County groundwater in a little bit more detail. So in year three, uh, we're hoping to start investigating the relationships between land use, soils, geology, and well construction as those things relate to the individual well water quality results. The goal here uh, is really to develop statistical models that would allow us to better predict water quality risk for those, those wells uh, that are not part of this program. So obviously there's, there's thousands uh, if not tens of thousands of wells in Greene County, uh, we aren't able to test all of them. But what we learn in this program through the use of, of statistical models might allow us to, to develop uh, good predictive tools uh, for other, you know, other people that, that live and, and work in Greene County uh, in terms of the well water quality that they might be accessing. Um, also in year three, uh, obviously the more years of data we have, the greater ability it gives us to understand trends, uh, to know which wells are fluctuating, how much, and maybe even why, uh, and then also maybe investigate uh, the role of weather uh, on water quality variability from year to year. And then lastly, uh, we will be kind of going live with a website that will allow us to communicate those project results. And I'll just give a quick demonstration here of what that website looks like and some of the features that we hope to be able to, to provide and, and build on. So uh, what you're seeing here uh, is an interactive map. Uh, again, it's showing some of the same maps we had in the presentation, but if we, if we kind of switch from the different variables um, you can kind of see how uh, we can look and see uh, the variability of the different analytes that we're looking at. Um, we can look and see from one year to the next uh, what the changes in those different variables might be. We can also look at that information aggregated by let's say municipality. Um, so all of that functionality is something that uh, we've been building into this website that will allow us to communicate those results uh, and allow participants to, to interact with these results in a little bit more, a uh, little bit more kind of informative way. Um, here, this tab just basically talks about the individual tests 
and provide some information on what the, the analyte is, why we're testing for it, and how to interpret that information. And then this last tab um, is another way that allows us to explore uh, the, the data in a little bit more detail. So one thing that we will be doing uh, later this year, um, we have assigned kind of uh, unique identifiers to the wells. And, and when participants are, are able to learn their unique identifier, um, they will be able to go in and see this unique identifier will only be shared with the participant, but you will be able to go in and see basically the individual results from year to year on graphs like these. So um, in this particular well record, as I select it, what you're seeing here is the concentration in 2019 versus the concentration in let's say 2020. Um, and again, as we go through more years, uh, this, this graphic of how water quality is changing with respect to each individual analyte will become more in, informative. Um, other things that this uh, website allows you to do is, is basically see, uh, again, how that information might look if it's aggregated by, uh, by municipality in, in different years. Um, so looking at 2019 uh, averages and, and, and median and means for the different towns, and then looking at what that looks like from, from, from year to year. Um, there's also this measure of the countywide uh, summary. So in this case, we're looking at the nitrate summary uh, year 2019. It's showing the average concentration. We can also see the average concentration in, in 20. 20. Um, so these tools are things that are evolving, uh, but definitely things that we want to make available uh, to, again, be able to communicate the results of the project uh, with those that might be interested. Um, so with that, we're going to end tonight's presentation. Um, and then I believe after the recording is stopped, uh, we'll have time for some individual Q&A that people might have regarding their individual results or maybe the, the project more broadly. Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, Victoria, uh, who's my main collaborator in Greene County, uh, but also uh, some of the other departments uh, that, uh, that, that have contributed, the Land and Water Conservation Department, the Greene County Health Department, Greene County Land Use and Zoning, uh, Extension Natural Resources Institute, and then also you'll see uh, the graphic for for Greene County down there, this, this project really would not be possible uh, if it wasn't for the Greene County Board uh, and the local leaders kind of throwing their support behind it to get the, the resources uh, to be able to conduct this project. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add, Victoria, before we open it up for Q&A? No, thank you so much, Kevin, for sharing the results.